All right, we're moving on. Uh, I'd now like to call Kathy. She's one of those one name, one names that you don't have to say anything else, but I'm going to. She's the owner and president of Nesset, which provides engineering and geological expertise to the oil industry. She recently completed a six-year term on the Federal Reserve Minneapolis Bank. She's a past chair of the North Dakota Petroleum Council, the North Dakota State Board of Higher Education past chair. She was a participant in the U.S. Army War College uh, Security Seminar. In fact, she just got back from there about 10 days ago. She actually took her son. So Kathy Nesset goes to Virginia to teach the future military leaders of our country energy, and this year she took her son along. So Kathy, thank you for that. She's the North Dakota Petroleum Council Hall of Fame member. Uh, she received the Williston Basin API Chapter Lifetime Achievement Award and the Virtuous Leadership Award from the University of Mary. And she's got a very distinguished panel. So please welcome Kathy, who will welcome our distinguished guests. Well, Ron, Ron, thank you very much. And Harold and Bruce, if you'll just indulge me just a second, I'm still catching my breath. Ron told us that he, and we're gonna to have to continue our town halls, and I suppose you'll help me here, highways, byways, bar rooms, doing our town hall without Lynn. And I'm not sure how that's gonna go. You ready to step up? Oh boy, it's gonna to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with you, Harold. But I'll tell you, what an opportunity. Lynn, congratulations, we love you and we're gonna miss you. Uh, my name is Kathy Nesset, and I am the moderator for this panel. Thank you very much for the Williston Basin Petroleum Conference. Today, I bring together with me two great leaders in their respective industries who have formed a unique partnership between oil and agriculture. And we, they are going to tackle the great challenges um, both of our, our industries are facing. Let me start with an introduction for Bruce Rastetter hands-on experience in global agriculture and renewable energy sectors, matched with his strong focus on strategic business development, has been key to building successful companies and advising government leaders on policy matters. Today, Summit Agriculture Group is an agriculture and renewable energy business with farmland holdings across North and South America. Bruce, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you for joining us. Now, Mr. Ham, you really do not need an introduction before this group, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh -oh. <laughs> Harold needs no introductions. I urge you to all read his book. May I just uh, borrow this a second here, Harold? Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what, just hold it up here. Game changer. Okay. Everybody right. should have a copy of this. I've read it, great book. Uh, you know what, just a second here. What prompted you to write that book? Well, it was a, a story that had to be told, and nobody had really told it uh, completely. It, you know, you'd seen segments here and there and the other, but such a remarkable thing had been accomplished, horizontal drilling and transformation that brought on energy renaissance, and nobody told the whole story. I'm not a writer, as you know, and, uh, and as you can tell, but anyway, somebody had to tell it, and finally I said, yeah, I've got to do it. So that's why I did. Thank you. Thank you for, for everyone. We all enjoy it. And we had a couple of next generation uh, young men here yesterday who will also uh, got their picture with you and they'll be reading that book as well. Uh -huh. They were wonderful little guys. That they Love were. Them. That's our next generation of engineers in this uh, oil field. We have all been firsthand witness to the great leadership Harold has provided, not only as the founder and owner of Continental Resources, but his leadership and dedication to our oil and natural gas industry and his willingness to stand up and fight the good fight for survival. Please help me welcome both Harold and Bruce. What an honor this is. And Harold, I'm gonna, once again, I'll, I'll go to you here and Bruce will step over to you in a minute. I wanna start, could you just give us a little, let's just, call it a little history lesson. Could you go back and tell us, you know, what was it like? I mean, I just, I'm fascinated by what it was, what was it like here in North Dakota? And bring us, bring us, you know, in the, the modified version, short version, where, where, where did you begin? Well, I began in Oklahoma, of course, and uh, Oklahoma is uh, more of a gas state, 
two-thirds of our production is natural gas and a third oil. But anyway, uh, Reagan deregulated natural gas, dumped all of the nation's reserves on the market at once, and drove the price down to nothing. <laughs> and so I thought, well, we've got to go to Plan B. And Plan B was oil. I always believed that the intrinsic value of oil was greater than that of gas. So we st studied the oily basins, and the Wilson Basin was one of those that came to the top. And so came, came up here and began looking for oil and found the Midfork Field, was one of the first ones we found, that was 1989. But, you know, my experience with the Wilson was that it was going to be a, a great basin of work. So anyway, that's where it started. But when we came here, uh, there were four rigs running in North Dakota. Uh, the industry had priced itself, uh, raised taxes up in the early 80s when oil hit $40 a barrel, run the taxes way out of sight and kill the, what was left of the industry. But it was, it was very dismal here. There were four rigs running and it was not a, you know, a very good uh, thing to see. But anyway, uh, the Canadians uh, passed a, some uh, tax incentives for horizontal drilling in the early 90s. And we talked uh, North Dakota and Montana into following the same uh, pattern to do the same thing, which they did. Uh, Montana first, and then North Dakota lowered the taxes back down where you could work with them. And, uh, and triggered horizontal drilling. And the first field we applied that to was Cedar Hills. That, I mean, it's a fascinating story. Flip all the way fast forward to today. Give us an example of what's, what's so different. You know, what, what have you, you know, where, we know where you, four rigs is where you started here in North Dakota. Now, what's the operation, more continental side of it here? Well, it's, uh, it's so exciting. Uh, somebody, I, I bet a guy on the street yesterday is getting my steps in, and, and he, uh, we talked about it. He said, this must be very exhilarating uh, to see what's happened up here in, in North Dakota. And I said, well, it truly is. And it, it, it really has been transformational, uh, what's happened with all the service companies, uh, you know, the landowners, the royalties, minerals, uh, all the working interest owners, uh, you know, has benefited from what's developed. So it's, it's so transformational, but not only for North Dakota, but also for the world. And, you know, it's, a, it's something that I see that's kind of bigger than all of us. And, uh, and uh, that's kind of the way I look at it. Uh, any, in, any one person, uh, you know, it, was, it took all of us to do it. And, uh, it's been uh, certainly just phenomenal uh, what's happened. You know, what a good point that is. You know, I mean, truly, this has been bigger than all of us, but also follows up, we're stronger together. Absolutely, it, you know, it, uh, this industry is united. You know, it's like this conference, uh, somebody told me, you know, this, this has a different feel to it than most conferences you go to, you know, because, it's for real. You know, we're living it, we're seeing it, you know, we're doing it. And everybody either benefits from it or not. And so, you're right, we're in it together and it, it does have a, a better feel because it's us. And don't we all love it? I mean, the energy, the excitement, I'm walking around and when you can walk from booth to booth and shake hands with the CEOs of all of these great companies, right from our little service companies to, uh, to the giants. And speaking of giants, we have two industry titans here on stage with me. Bruce, let's go to you a little bit. Can you give us a little bit um, of your background in both business and agriculture? Great, and it's great to be here, Kathy, and I really appreciate, Ron, the, the invite in particular to be on, on stage with Harold and, uh, and just the whole relationship and understanding more about oil, gas, and my background, I, I grew up on a small farm, a 300 acre farm, north central Iowa. Didn't intend to be, stay involved in ag. Went to the University of Iowa, was gonna be an attorney. Decided I wanted to come back, be involved in agriculture. And uh, it was at the farm crisis time when land values had dropped, farm commodities had dropped dramatically in the early 1980s. 
And, and so things were changing. I, I think not in, different than today in terms of change and trying to adapt to it. And I think as I think about fast forwarding on, on ag in my lifetime, and oil gas has been the same way, it's been about how do you produce more with less? And we always thought about it in agriculture, how do you get more efficient? So the farm I grew up on in high school produced 140 bushel corn. Last summer in dry weather, it was 250 bushel. So more bushels per acre with less input. We called it surviving, getting more efficient, sustainability, and, and we kid today that somebody came up with the idea of CI or carbon reduction, and, uh, but it, it really was about sustainability, how you add value to products, and how you do that. And, and so my life has been in kind of at the intersection of ag, renewables, change, and then ethanol, produce, how do we produce food, fiber, and energy out of growing crops? And the governor pointed out uh, biodiesel and uh, ethanol production. And the reality is, and it hasn't always been a perfect relationship, as, as so many of you know, between oil, gas, and ethanol, but how we work together to decarbonize the liquid fuel tank so that we can go to the next generation of liquid fuels, not a transition fuel, but the next generation has always been what we've been about. And oil, gas, agriculture, and biofuels, in my mind, have, have worked together and will work closely together to create and respond to those new markets like we always have. So today, uh, we have production ag, we raise corn, soybeans, feed some cattle, have hog buildings, and then separately, we do private equity work in in value-added ag, both here in North America and Brazil. Uh, the, what has led to the project and the partnership with Harold is the background we have in the biofuel industry. Uh, today, we have 57 ethanol plants that have signed up with us that impact about 100 million acres in the upper Midwest and in our five states that, are, that we're in. And, uh, and North Dakota clearly has the resources and is best positioned to benefit from that on ag, oil, energy, and, and that alignment. So I'm excited to be part of this project and uh, clearly a project that, that we feel is, is critically important as we have record land values, we have decreased farm income in the last few years, and we're dependent upon commodity prices and adding value in this country, and in particular in the Midwest of those products. So uh, excited to develop projects that can, can make an impact in our communities. Thank you, Bruce. And you know, you used the term trans transition. We're not talking about a transition from one source of energy to another. This is, you know, we've used the term or heard the term transformative. Yes, it is changing, but we're not leaving one or the other. And I appreciate that. You know, I also want to you know, get a little bit further into, you, you touched on in a bit about the interdependency between ag and oil. Can you, can you lead off and tell us why is that so important in today's world? Well, I think maybe a little story, and as you know, uh, Harold has spent his lifetime trying to make an impact on the industry. And one of the interesting meetings we had early on was with uh, the junior senator from North Dakota that I had not met until we started the project, Harold. And, so we went to DC and we were explaining the project and why it was important in North Dakota that's both obviously an oil state and an ag state. And uh, what this project was gonna be about capturing CO2. And in the middle of that conversation, and I have to admit I was a little uncomfortable because I'm not sure Senator Kramer has been a big fan of biofuels always in his lifetime. And Senator Kramer stopped the meeting and yelled at his, one of his aides to make a call. And he said, I've got Harold Hamm, the preeminent oil gas guy, and I've got an ethanol guy sitting with him. They're partnering on a project. I want to make sure hell hasn't froze over. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the reality, and I think uh, Kathy, I said it, and Harold and I have talked about it, it, the reality, oil, gas, agriculture, and biofuels have become intertwined in a world that's demanding more sustainability. And in my mind, the uniqueness of this project, you're having an oil guy who's helped build wealth across this country and the world by lower energy costs, teaming with biofuels to lower the carbon score 
in the gas tank and allow both industries to attain new markets. Like agriculture cannot attain sustainable aviation fuel without lowering its carbon score. And we cut in half 8 billion gallons of ethanol's carbon score with this project. We create greater demand for corn that we all know, and North Dakota knows, you're gonna raise more corn every year. And we will in Iowa and across the world. And how we can add value to US products is, is critical, and, and back to, there is no reason to go down the path of electric vehicles that people don't want to buy, have higher CI scores than what we're going to have in the liquid gas tank, and how we can bring 18 million tons annually of CO2 to North Dakota, to over 200,000 acres of voluntary agreements we have with landowners west of Bismarck. We have over 74% voluntary right away across the whole pipeline. And and impact agriculture in this country and also work with oil to lower that CI score and all the things you're all doing in oil production and bring a valuable product long term to North Dakota that has the geology and steadied you know, for decades and can safely store it and can help industry here and, and take advantage of new technology. So I, that's why I'm excited about the project. It, it's a hard project, but it's certainly nothing easy Nothing good becomes as easy to do, but it impacts such a broader group of, of people across this country and across the world. And, and making sure we go to the next generation, not a transition. Excellent, thank you. Harold, let's get back a little bit because we, we're talking about the, you know, the coming together of both. Now you, you have a first of its kind investment in Summit Carbon Solutions. Tell us a little bit about that story and how, how is that coming, coming and leading us to the future? Well, first of all, uh, you know, I think you have to look uh, at the legacy relationship between oil and ag. You know, without uh, agriculture and landowners, uh, we, we couldn't drill wells. And so it's just a, you know, a natural relationship uh, that's there. We, we heard about the project and uh, uh, Jeff Hume, who everybody knows here, uh, uh, came to us and said, you know, there's an interesting project uh, that's being proposed and, you know, it really has a lot of merit to it. And uh, we, ought to, we ought to look at it closer. And I said, well, okay, and, you know, maybe we meet the principles. And so uh, Bruce and Justin came down and got acquainted with them and r realized that, wow, these are real high-quality people they know their business, they know what they're doing. And I felt like that, you know, knowing uh, uh, pipelines and right away and all, all the stuff that goes into it, uh, and also underground sequestration, that Continental could play a meaningful additive role. And so the more we talked about, the, the more I, I believed in it. And, uh, and also, you know, as far as internal combustion engines, uh, you know, what it mean for the longevity of them, and, and also uh, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do to uh, carbon, uh, uh, take that carbon that was being dumped into the atmosphere and basically sequester it forever. So I felt it was a, a good project that really would have great potential down the road as well. Well, thank you. You know, and I want to take from that, Harold, and let's just follow, and I'd like, you know, maybe comments from both of you on this. You know, why North Dakota? Why here? And, you know, there might be some people in the room that are, that are new to CCUS, carbon capture utilization and storage, or just the carbon capture and storage. So can you, why North Dakota? What, what do you, what well, do you mean? Well, North Dakota, you know, has been a great visionary state, and you know, they set the stage for uh, for carbon capture early on with uh, Governor Hovind's work, uh, worked with him extensively, uh, but uh, saw him put in place, uh, you know, the primacy that uh, it took here in North Dakota to have uh, uh, the type of injection wells necessary. Uh, and basically that came from 2010, so we're talking 15 years ago. Uh, when you laid the, the groundwork for that. Also with uh, Dakota gasification, uh, you know, what had been done there and 
all the millions of tons of uh, CO2 that was generated and taken basically to oil fields in Canada, Wayward Field, um, and what had been done with that there, uh, I thought, wow, that's a that's really good purpose. Uh, and so, anyway, North Dakota is uh, a great state that basically set the stage for it regulatory-wise, and, uh, and, and certainly it had the geologic uh, reservoirs that uh, was conducive for uh, sequestration. Uh, so, you know, it was just a, a natural fit. Well, I agree with you totally. And when you get talking about that natural, you know, geologic jackpot that we have here, we could talk a whole day about that. We could. We could spend some time on it. <laughs> we could. Bruce also to bring you into this. Why North Dakota? Why, Why North Dakota? And that Harold obviously uh, knew the technical background in North Dakota before, before we did. We had started the project, signed up ethanol plants, and being from Iowa, and I, t I tell the governor this on the first visit. We. If you knew nothing about sitting in Iowa about the two states on geologic oil work and oil gas, but if you had the choice between Illinois and North Dakota, which one would you pick that you would feel would be more business friendly, would have developed more things? And, and uh, fortunately, we cho chose North Dakota and then have learned a whole lot along the way. And, and one of the really terrific visits we had early on was with EERC at, at North Dakota University. And I was president of the Board of Regents in a voluntary job in Iowa governing the three universities. And we always tried to get the universities to work with private business to develop opportunity for the state. And, and, and we continue to do that at the universities in Iowa. But that is a terrific example of for decades of work in development of the Balkans, in development of CCS, that, that is really important to not just North Dakota, but the world. And so for us, learning that early on, and I, that's actually how we met Jeff, uh, that sits on the board there, Harold, and uh, said that you need to meet a guy, Bruce, by the name of Harold Ham, And it been one of the terrific experiences on business through the stress of the development, the expertise, uh, the, the staying power that Harold has of believing in projects, not, not just with money, but how do you do the right thing? How do you make sure that in large projects that, that you navigate you know, all the challenges we have today? So, and then we just met some terrific people here in North Dakota. It's a positive state. You, you embrace success and, and want to see more of it. So couldn't be happier, Kathy, in being here. Well, thank you very much. On behalf of North Dakota, we say thank you. That's awesome. Let me just let me just ask a question of you, Bruce. And and I don't know that you'd even have an answer, but we're we're oil and gas here, and that's generally you know what our focus is for this. We've heard you know Lynn Helms talk about the need for you know enhanced oil. The governor talked about that. Do you see us getting away to enhanced oil recovery? Well, I think I think everyone knows that our project is is. Uh, is, is what we're clearly doing is we're capturing CO2, the purest form, from ethanol plants and compressing it, put it in as a liquid, putting it through the pipe, putting it underground just short of the Balkans in geology that works and has been studied, uh, as I mentioned, by ERC and others. And uh, we're, we signed easements with over 200,000 acres, voluntary farm ground in that area right near Minn Kota, and we're partnering with Minn Kota on a well and uh, we'll partner with them on diversity of wells as hopefully their project goes forward on that base load. Uh, but today, you know, the opportunity for us and, and our commitment is, is direct sequestration. But having that resource brought to the state and developed to the state can lead to other things down the road, as you suggest, Kathy. And, but today, you know, we've got that commitment and, and the best source and the best revenue for us you know, to make this work on an expensive project is direct sequestration. That's, that's wonderful because, I, I mean, we have the greatest entity in the University of North Dakota Energy Environmental Research Center led by Charlie Gorecki, and who better to take us to that, you know, to that um, enhanced oil recovery. And we're not quite there yet. You know, we're getting there. Harold, let me get back because I want to, I would just want to follow up. You know, when we talk about the history, you know, you've been here for a while. I've been here for a while. That's good. Um, 
what do you see for similarities back to the days of early days of your horizontal drilling when you really were getting started in that? Do you see similarities between those complexities and challenges and where we are today? I do. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people. Uh, you know, we started Cedar Hill, for instance, uh, proposing wells, uh, drilling, drilling there. Uh, the first thing that hit you was that nobody is participating with us. Nobody believed in it. They saw it as a money pit. <laughs> uh, you know, so there's a lot of non-believers uh, and there's people that that really weren't the visionaries uh, that that you needed. Uh, so, you know, wound up two, two companies in the whole field. And that was us in Burlington that, that uh, developed that. Uh, but I see some similarities here. People have some doubts, and, and you have to work through it. And we've done a great job, I think, of doing that and meeting those challenges. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I was here when Governor Burgum, I think in 2021, said that, you know, by 2050, that North Dakota is going to be a, a zero carbon state. And I thought, what did he say? <laughs> so, wow, how could we ever do that? But you think about it, the amount of carbon that we could take from the air and, and uh, inject in this state would make us, even with the production we have, net zero carbon state. It's tremendous, tremendous opportunity that we have. And so, you know, I'm a scientist, uh, you know, as you, as you are, and knowing what we need for sustainability in the world and going forward, I think it's important. Uh, and as I said from the beginning, I think it was the right thing to do, and I still believe it today. You know, I totally agree with you. It is the right thing to do, and it is, it is you know, bigger than, you know, than all of us, you know, when you really look at it. And I want to go to that with, with both of you. We touched on this a little bit. You are two giants in your industries coming together, shaking hands, and making things happen. How do the rest of us do that? We're the, we're the average Joe and average Jane walking down, you know, Main Street, Tioga. How, how do we do it on a day-to-day on a -day basis? Well, there, there's lots of ways. Uh, uh, being smart about everything we've done, uh, you know, you see, you see uh, all the advancement in our industry, uh, you know, whether it's, I mean, wellbore, uh, siding, <laughs> uh, multipads, all those things that make us uh, more ecologically friendly uh, with what we're uh, doing, orderly development, across the entire field, as Lynn Helms uh, said, you know, all the people that were putting forth all the propaganda, uh, Russian-inspired gas land, you know, uh, had water burning at the faucet, and all those things, uh, none of which occurred. And we, we've had to deal with some of those same things with this project, people, you know, coming out with all kind of different uh, uh, scare tactics. Uh, but you know you, you do you you don't believe those, and you, you calm the crowd, uh, you know you calm the fears, and uh, and go forward. So, I think I think the average uh, North Dakotan today, uh, you know, needs to listen, uh, be informed, and uh, be aware of uh, what they can do to help, and uh, in order to go forward. But. You know, uh, I, I believe in the future, as Lynn Helms pointed out here this morning, uh, the future is great. Uh, uh, and, you know, we, we certainly want to be a part of it and the, the transformation into a bright future for mankind. Thank you. And as we wrap up here, Bruce, your, your comments on that. How do, how do we all work? Yeah, I think, I think if you do transformative projects, they impact a broader network than, than just what you're building or raising money for. And, and this project is an example of it, whether we talk about liquid fuels as uh, next generation, but more importantly, and for us on, a, on the ag side, I think one of the things that we've seen is profitability on the farm drives investment across the specter. So in science, technology, innovation, 
new seed production, techniques to apply nitrogen. You know, one of the reasons John Deere invested in our fund in this project is because of the technology to help on-farm lower carbon scores that create new markets. And I believe in capitalism driving economic opportunities. So if ethanol plants have new markets working with oil, gas, then they will pay more for corn and that will drive profitability, innovation on the farm on carbon. And you're seeing programs today where we can go to a net zero liquid fuel within the next decade. And we won't have to worry about liquid, liquid fuels not being around for a long, long time. And so that's what we feel good about in terms of the broader group that we impact across the spectrum. Bruce, thank you very much. And thank you both, gentlemen. This is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's impressive to see two great industries come together. And with that, Mr. Ham, I would love to turn this to you. I think you have a closing comment and maybe uh, have a, a special treat for all of us here in a video. Yes, uh, you know, one of the persons that was invited and wanted to be here uh, uh, today was uh, President Trump. And uh, uh, this date means so much to him. Uh, in 2016, uh, we invited him here and the delegates of North Dakota put him over uh, the limit, and uh, he became the nominee uh, for president here, right here in North Dakota, and, and spoke to uh, the, the crowd. <laughs> and it was, it was fabulous. Uh, he, he set out his energy policy that day, and, and uh, we knew what, you know, what he stood for and what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. And it was tremendous. He wanted to be here with us. And, but unfortunately, uh, the other side has held him in court instead of uh, letting him out on a campaign trail and doing anything like this, the fun things in life. And so he's been uh, held captive, so to speak. And so, but anyway, uh, he, uh, he put together a, a short video and uh, I believe we can we can see that and play it right now. So he can't be here with us, but he's here in spirit. So with that, we'll see the video. Hello, North Dakota, and a very special thanks to the great Harold Hamm, along with Governor Doug Burgum and Senators Kevin Kramer and John Hoven. It's an honor to speak with the men and women who are on the front lines of driving the American energy dominance that we so much want. We have to have it. And we had it just four years ago. We were dominant. As you know, under my leadership, the United States became the number one producer of oil and natural gas in the world. I approved the Keystone XL and the Dakota Access Pipelines. They got done, and they were all set. Now, unfortunately, Dakota went well, but the Keystone Biden ended immediately. And those workers should fire 40,000 of them, maybe 48,000. They should fire the head of their union who approved and went to Biden and endorsed him because he withdrew. And what he did, he withdrew and took that pipeline and ended it almost in his first week in office. So why would a union do that to its members? Get rid of that guy. I withdrew from the disastrous Paris Climate Accord. We slashed approval times for pipelines and other energy infrastructures at levels that they've never seen before. I opened ANWR for energy development, which Republicans have been trying to do for 40 years. It's the largest energy source potentially anywhere in the world, including Saudi Arabia and Russia. And they went out, and in their first week, they ended it. But we'll get it going again. If we had continued on the path of the Trump administration, hundreds of millions more barrels of oil would have been pumped, and our economy would be much, much stronger than it is today. We would have been in a whole different place and we wouldn't have had inflation. Under Crooked Joe Biden, the American energy industry is under siege. It's under crisis. Crooked Joe Biden has made clear that he wants to abolish your industry and with it destroy our economy and send us into a new dark age of blackouts, poverty, and deindustrialization. Joe Biden re-entered the horrible Paris Accord, so bad for our country massively raised taxes on energy producers. He's finalizing power plant regulations that will demolish oil, gas, and coal-fired power plants. And all over the nation, they're going to be closing up. Joe Biden killed the Keystone XL pipeline. And his electric vehicle mandate, one of the great disasters of all time, is an attempt to ban gasoline-powered cars and trucks. 
with electric, and they don't go far, they cost too much, and they're all going to be made in China. Biden's plans will obliterate the North Dakota petroleum industry, and your great governor knows that better than anybody. Send gas and electricity costs soaring and turn America into an absolute third world country. And that's what's happening right now. Every American will be poorer and less free. And remember this, we've got to win this election or we're not going to have a country anymore. But if Biden does win, all of those oil projects that right now he let go because oil went up so much after he became, he closed down a lot of leases, closed down a lot of everything. The day he got in, he's ending it all. He's letting it go right now because he doesn't want the prices to go up more than they already have, which is at least 50 percent. But if he ever became president, it all comes to an end. Everyone in that room, everyone in that industry is going to be out of business. When I'm president, oil and gas workers of America will once again have a true friend and an ally in the Oval Office, just as you had four years ago. On day one, I will cancel the electric vehicle mandate. We will end Joe Biden's war on American energy, and the United States will unleash its vast resources to unlock the American dream for millions and millions of our people. With your support, we will make America great again, and we will do it quickly. Thank you once again, and everyone there today. I really appreciate all of your support. Keep up the great work, and God bless you all. thing I'll say is that uh, I had dinner with him Monday evening, and uh, it was uh, a, a great uh, occasion in New York. And uh, just he and I and another gentleman there with us. And anyway, he wanted me to personally express his gratitude for all support from North Dakota and all of his friends up here. Uh, he really wished he could be here. And uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank gentlemen. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.